So we've got um, some confusion about what what was OER or not. Ah, yeah. And um, sorry, Marion. Yeah, you pick, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say because I think that was an interesting comment because there's a very precise definition of OER, which is um, openly licensed materials that you can reuse. But there's all sorts of people using all sorts of stuff that don't necessarily have that licensing on them, which means they're not technically OER, but then they are very useful things you can use for your teaching and learning. Um, and, you know, well, you were hinting at that, Dave, that there's this kind of grey area in practice. And, I mean, the other thing that, that you and Will were, were hinting at was when does it make a difference that you've got the openly licensed material? Um, it's interesting sitting here in this panel with people from the OU that if you are offering a course as part of a provider such as ourselves in Oxford and the OU, you've got to be absolutely scrupulous. You can't be using things that there's any ambiguity about your rights to use. But if you're teaching in a classroom where, you know, there's you and your students, is it as important? I mean, I think that's a very real question for, for a lot of academics. Well, and also, Marion, I think when we were doing the, our study on the use of OER in the UK, it seemed obvious to me, well, I mean, you brought this point up, but most people, especially in the field of education, will put material online because they want it to be used. So it would be a shame if you didn't use it because it wasn't licensed. I suppose, I mean, I had a particularly grumpy week about OER, I'll be honest with you, because it strikes me that... Uh, that most people have this kind of innate, this sort of cultural understanding that if they put their material online, it will get reused. And generally, if they don't want it to be reused, they won't put it online, if you see what I mean. So uh, I know that this is not the legal situation, but it seems to me that uh, the very act of posting it online it is, is saying in some ways, I'm happy for you to reuse this as long as you cite me. It seems it would be naive to imagine that that wasn't going to happen. Now, again, in the study that we did, we found that there was an awful lot of reuse taking place and this was something that I was trying to contribute via blogging and, and, and in the um, email discussion was that at a level of personal teaching practice um, I'm not convinced how relevant the licensing is uh, because it's a very it's very low risk. Um, I, I personally, I think. I mean, we have to separate legal from sort of ethical, if you like. I think most people who post materials online, as long as they're properly cited, as long as their stuff isn't intellectually stolen, I doubt they'd have a problem with it. Now, having said that, I forgot to um, I forgot to cite the attribution for the image we used on our weeks. <laughs> on our week's uh, uh, web page and that got picked up by somebody in the blog and I did feel bad about that but I didn't feel bad about it from a legal point of view I wasn't expecting to be dragged to court I just felt bad about it because I'd used somebody's work and hadn't cited it properly um, and, and I suppose that's a reflection on how I'd feel if other people took my work and didn't cite it so um, I wonder I, I mean I know that at an institutional level so if you're using OER to create a course which you then put back out there on the web you know at that high institutional level where things are labeled as being a product of your institution then licensing becomes quite a big deal but individual teaching practice I wonder how important it is because good materials are just good material and if it's on the web we're going to use it one way or another I don't know if that's other people's experience but I just uh, rather than carrying on rambling about this I suppose my point is that um, I think that this is why there's a confusion over what OER is because generally speaking individual teaching practice uses good stuff and ignores stuff that isn't very good. I, I don't know what other people's reflections are on that. Hi, uh, actually I'd like to comment on that because uh, one thing is that there is you know, there's a notion of, of fair use which we don't talk about a lot but um, you know, there is a, an extent in which it's, it's legal and ethical to use licensed materials as well. Um, and, and that's something that's, I think, still a bit vague in a lot of people's mind. But the other thing is that there's, as, as you say, um, you know, they, there's, uh, there's a big difference between if I go into class and there's 20 students and I show them a website, uh, it's one thing. If, if I copy content from that website and put it on a website, which it has some institutional affiliation, it's a completely different ballgame. 
And we had various issues with, with content for this MOOC. You know, we had issues both with uh, some unclarity about the actual license, the default license of content on the MOOC. And we had to go through various uh, discussions with um, our sort of intellectual property department here at the OU about that. We also had issues about using some content from, uh, from OU courses as part of the MOOC. Eventually it was all sorted, but there, there's a lot of hoops you need to go to in order to sort those things. Um, another issue I think is that people are sometimes reluctant to reuse content, especially in online courses, because there is this um, notion that, well, you know, if, if I'm giving them somebody else's content, then what are they paying for? You know what I mean? Like, you know, if, if I'm yeah. giving a course that's reusing open content, then students are really paying for something which they could get for free. And that, for me, is, is where OER links into learning design. And that's why I thought it's important to have this part of this MOOC. Yeah. Because if you think about, if you, if you take a learning design perspective and you say, what you're giving students is, is the activities, and then you find or produce whatever resources you need to, to, to support those activities, then it kind of shifts the balance. So I don't know how much that relates to, to your question, Steve, but uh, anyway, I, I hope it's relevant. Well, I, I think Mary has got something there. Yeah, I think it's very much true that when you focus on learning design, you really see that extra thing that you're getting in a course that's made of other people's materials. The other metaphor that's a really useful one to use when you're talking to academics about OER and they're getting very wound up about the using other people's material thing is this, you know, you never teach a course without referring to other people's articles, other people's books. You don't say, I've got to write every bit of material I do on a face-to-face -face course. OER is a different type of thing, you know, it's it's arguably many OER are something that's slightly different from um, just an article or a, a, a textbook but you know fundamentally it's other content that's informing your learning in different media and so people have academia has always done that I mean you would be uh, what's the word you would be giving your students an inferior learning experience if you were only giving them what had been produced by your university on a given topic so sorry I get a bit wound up about this one well so and I also, you should be I doing think... it I mean, I agree with you on that, Marion, and and also, if you use a public library system, then then these materials are then a lot of the materials you might use on a course that you paid for are also publicly available. So, and when we um, but we spoke to we didn't speak to very many students, but the students we did speak to when we were doing our OER study, we'd actually ask them, well, how would you feel if you know a large percentage of the resources that were used in your course didn't come from the institution you were at and it was clear that they hadn't even considered it and that they didn't really have a problem with it what they wanted was that they wanted good quality well curated materials that they could trust were credible and valid and were on topic and as long as they had those they weren't too worried about the source um, in terms of which institution it, it, it came from. So I, I think that that's, it's a bit of a red herring. What's interesting to reflect on there is why, why we'd be worried about that. And I think it's an effect of the kind of um, fluidity of the technology rather than the principle of, of, of sharing an open practice. Um,